I'm recording. I've got the backup recording going. Are well. you actually recording though? Okay. I'm, I'm literally, I'm looking at the recording. It's, I see the waveform going up and down. Right. Because I have had multiple occasions recently where you have said I'm recording and I remember and you I've saying I'm recording. I've got the I'm backup recording, recording going but in as well. the audio so that I am provided here. by you, you're, so there's two I different never hear the words I'm, I'm recording. recording. <laughs> so are you recording? There's 100% chance that I'm recording. Although you can never be 100% sure, so I'll say 99% sure that I'm recording. Levels, levels. Levels, levels. I very frequently have people ask me, have you ever like spoke about why you use a to-do app and what are the apps that you use? And my usual like inclination for that answer is like, yes, but like on 20 episodes of Cortex. <laughs> like I have no one place that I could even start to imagine pointing you to. Right. And yeah. it's easier now for like when someone says to me yearly themes, I know those episodes now, right? And like we've condensed it over time. Mm -hmm. So now on every yearly themes episode, we talk about the themes in the abstract a little bit before getting into the rest, right? Mm -hmm. But what I thought of outside of the original set of episodes and then some that's come since, there are some core parts of productivity, like to-do apps, email, time tracking, communication, and calendaring. Mm. These are things that we talk about all the time. They're very important. We talk about the apps that we use, but maybe not so much for a while have we spoken about why we do these things that we do. Mm. So I thought for episode 101, we could do Productivity Tools 101. I think you like that mainly because of how it works with the title. And I completely agree. It's two parts of it. I like yeah. how it works with the title and I'll never forget the episode to point people to. Yeah, that, that, was, that was your main pitch to me yeah. is like, look, I want to be able to have an episode when people ask, can you tell me about why you use these systems yep. that, I, that you can point them to? And you're like, I'll never forget the number 101. So let's just make it that episode. And I completely agree. I think probably the one to start with is to do systems because it is the core of productivity, right? Like it's the very central part is your task manager. So I was thinking about this earlier today and there is no one true way of being productive, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's no one answer for everyone. There's no one system that's going to work for everyone. Like each person needs to pick and choose the parts that work for them and the parts that don't work for them. And this is the process of figuring out how to manage one's own life is finding the parts that work for you. And even though there isn't one true system, I think sometimes you can divide people up into a spectrum. And I think one of the biggest spectrums of how people manage their life is the spectrum of task manager and calendar. Some people are much more on like the calendar is primary and the task manager is secondary. And some people are more task manager is primary and calendar is secondary. I think both of us are pretty heavily on the task manager as foundational side. Yeah. And so I think that like, that's why we're going to start here because to both of us, I think it's sort of inconceivable of if you were taking someone whose life is disorganized and they're holding up this mess, which is their life, and they're saying, how do I get started trying to get all of this in shape? Both of us would say, to do system, this is where you need to start. This is where it all begins. And I think part of the reason for me as to why I believe that as strongly as I do is I think people that believe in the to-do system as core still use calendars frequently mm -hmm. but from my experience of people that believe in calendars as the ruler don't necessarily even use a task list of any kind because just everything goes on the calendar um and just in my experience of people that that run in one of those yeah. ways that kind of seems to be the way that things break down. Because I believe both are very important. Yeah. And I wouldn't say equally important, but they, I believe, are mutually important. Like, you should use both. Yes. Because they need each other, I think, to be able to work effectively. Yeah. But I, like you, believe that the to-do system is the core of everything. Mm. Because one of the main things for me is I also am aware of myself enough that I know that... No matter how many tasks I set for myself on a day, I, I won't always do them all. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about a task list of any kind 
is that you have the ability to move stuff. You see that they're overdue. You didn't complete them. But with a calendar, by and large, it's gone Mm -hmm. once the day has passed. Unless you have a... I mean, unless you have a system of checking the previous days, but if you're doing that, then you really ought to be using a task list or to-do system of some kind, yeah. because at that point, that's the life that you're living. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, I, th- I think to, to try to really start at the at the foundation of this, of mm-hmm. there was a long ago, long dead now version of Gray who never used a to-do system, and floated through life just like to do you know sometimes doing stuff and sometimes not doing stuff and eventually he got to a point in life where he realized he could not manage all of the things that needed to get done and it is so specific to me of exactly when that moment was when i was in teacher training school and they gave me this enormous list of a hundred plus things that all had to be completed in order to get your teacher certification. And I remember like, oh no, like I'm never going to be able to keep track of all of this because some of them were really huge items. Some of them were really teeny tiny small ones. And I'm like, I'm never going to keep track of this. And so one of my very first versions of trying to figure out how am I going to actually get all of these things done was taking this huge list that the university gave me and turning it into a spreadsheet and trying to be like, okay, let me try to break this down in a way so that this is the list that the university is going to use to decide whether or not I become a teacher. But I need to turn this into a list that makes sense for me. Uh Aha. Right. Like this is a criteria that they have. Now let me make it into a selection of things that I need to have achieved. Yes. And even just like wording changes or what do these things mean in my own life? A to-do system, if it's functioning well, this is part of the job that it does. Is it's like, it's your translation of what the external world is requiring of you. And like getting it into a frame that makes sense for you. Everybody's brain is different and you just want to have stuff organized in a, in a particular way. And so like that, that was one of the very first times I was actually getting serious about trying to keep track because I knew like I knew me and I was like, I am going to totally fail if I just try to do this the way I've done school before of like, I'll remember most things, right? Mm. And that's the other big part of it to do system is don't try to remember stuff. I think this can also be a very regular progression for people in life is that you're growing up and the world manages a lot of things for you. And you can sort of get by by just remembering things. But like, again, at some point in life, usually past the point when you should have recognized it, you come to a stage where it's just like, there's, there's too many things to remember. You, you cannot rely on your own brain to keep track of all the things that you need to know. And the penalties for forgetting things start to become real. Yes, yes. They're not they're not pretend penalties like in school where they're like, oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're going to have a conversation with the teacher and they're going to be very upset with you. And it's like, OK, and then what? Well, then you go back to class. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> um, like, yeah, no, then they then they start becoming, you know, real, meaningful, impactful on the rest of your life kind of problems. And this is also the part where for me, I started keeping track of a notebook of just like writing stuff down in a notebook and and referring back to it. People often ask me like, oh, when you first started using a notebook, like what was the system? What were you doing? And the answer is there was no system at all. It was just getting in the habit of if there's something in your head, get it out of your head and put it on a piece of paper. And as long as you come back to that piece of paper on some regular basis, you'll start to build up your own kind of system. Like, of course, we spend pretty much all of our time talking about how our apps and devices are the things that we use to keep track of this stuff. But Mm -hmm. pen and paper is the absolute best way to begin. Oh, for sure. Yeah, Making lists. And 
this is like, you know, take notes and that kind of stuff, but making lists, lists of things you want to do, lists of things you should do. And that's how I started, right? Like I was kind of predisposed to this. Like my entire working life, I've always had some kind of to-do list, checklist, because mm-hmm. I was perfectly placed for it as a person that is that has a predilection for two things, pens and paper and nicely designed apps. Oh, right. Of course. Yes. That makes much more sense that this path was much more obvious to you than it was to me. Because I wanted (laughs) to have an excuse to use pens and paper or like OmniFocus looks like a nicely designed application for the iPhone. I'll get that boy in his first banking job that nobody cares about him but he's got like a 25 pound application that he's using right like yeah Yeah. that's what I'm gonna do but you know so I I have always found it very easy to start this stuff because Mm -hmm. I wanted to use the things that were involved in it but if you don't come at it from my perspective and most people don't they come at it from Gray's perspective Starting in the same places, pen and paper is is perfect because it removes by its simplicity the complications that any application will give you. Right. Yeah. Like any half decent application, all of the apps that we'll talk about today of the stuff that we use, they want projects from you. They want dates and times from you. They want mm-hmm. notification access they want to be able to integrate with this part of the system like they want so much and it can seem like a big hurdle to jump over but Mm -hmm. if you just start by getting a notebook of any kind and a pen of any kind and just writing Mm -hmm. down every day like these are the things i have to do or want to do or a combination of the both you check them all off and then the next day you just write that list out again like yeah. that's the start of any of these types of systems. And no matter what you end up graduating to, and maybe it's nothing because for many people, this is a perfectly valid way to keep it going is just to write out a pen and paper list every day. Mm-hmm. No matter what it is you end up graduating to, you will benefit from having spent the time at these real basics. If you yeah. really don't want to use a pen and paper, any notes app, just like a bulleted list, right? Like yeah. Google Keep, Apple Notes, they'll all let you make checklists, right? You can just use those, and it's nice and simple. Yeah, I I mean, my entire teaching career, when I was teaching physics, I ran all of the organization of, you know, what classes do I need to prepare for, what needs to be done. That was an entirely paper-based system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I was just using index cards, and sometimes I was using some pieces of paper on a clipboard. And teaching is a job where there's like, there's a million things to keep track of. And paper is totally up to that task. Like you don't need a digital system. Again, if someone is listening to this and they're at that starting point where they just feel overwhelmed, right? You know, like they've come to this show because someone has said, oh, start with this episode if you don't know where to start, right? And then like, okay, well, the probability then is it's a person who might be feeling overwhelmed about like, what do I do? And you have a problem with there with that of like you want to try to solve this feeling of overwhelmedness and you want to try to solve like i don't know what to do so you have a problem which is that your life is is disorganized well if you're trying to also learn a to-do app at the same time now you have two problems Mm -hmm. right and it's like this this doesn't help you at all and yeah any notebook will do you know one of one of my favorite things to do with people when they're overwhelmed is to either take like a bunch of A4 pages and and cut them in half or take index cards and just like start writing down on each half sheet of paper or each index card something that's on your mind. The garage is a huge mess, like, and you put that on one index card. Just like start writing down the stuff that's on your mind. And this is where I really think paper does have an advantage that there is something more real about physically writing with your hand to get out the thoughts in your head than typing them in a list. Mm -hmm. And it's still something that I do now, years later, as a person who feels like I have my life very well organized, three, four times a year, like I'll just sit down with some index cards or some paper and just start writing out some stuff as a kind of calibration of, of where I am. And when you do that, you'll naturally start to see, you know, the reason why I think like index cards are half pieces of paper is you, you kind of start to see, oh, 
these things are all related, right? You know, the, or these things are connected to each other or like this thing really needs to happen before this thing. And with just paper on a desk, you can move it around and put things that are, that are related near each other. And again, I think that process of physically moving the things in your life around is much more helpful than digitally moving items up or down a list. If you want to feel like you're in control of something, physically moving it will definitely help you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have power over this task because I can move it anywhere on this desk. This task can't move me. Look how flimsy it is. Yeah, it's just a piece of paper. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent point there. So that is the great place to start. And once you've done that, then you can start looking at some of the specifics of okay, you know, how do I want to organize this? And you should almost certainly start with paper lists. But even then, you've now separated the get everything off your mind phase from the how do I want to organize it going forward phase, which is completely impossible if you're just starting with a to-do app that you're not mm -hmm. familiar with. No matter how simple it looks, like they all have their weird quirks that paper just doesn't. So I think that's that's really a place to start. Yeah, starting with a very, very, very simple not to do app. Pen and paper, thoroughly recommend, but if you really mm -hmm. don't want to do that, every device has a notes app. Use the notes app. Yeah. Once you start doing that for a while, I think you'll start to get an idea of to what things feel important to you. So like one of the things that pushed me to an application was, all right, I like having this stuff, but I want something to tell me to do it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I needed notifications, right? Like right. that if, you know, I can write these things down, but I still have to remember that this task has to be done at two o'clock on Wednesday. Well, mm -hmm. it, when you start getting to those kinds of areas, that's where you need to start looking for an application of some kind. And there are many, many options. I think it would be too much for us even to try and list the things that we've used. <laughs> but I think these days... There really are, I think that there's even more kind of like agreement on the stuff that people use. Mm -hmm. Even in like the last couple of years, it feels like there are less of these types of applications now. Oh, do you, do you think there's been a, because I don't, I don't follow the market very closely, mm. but do, do you feel like there's been a consolidation of to-do apps over time? Yes. And I think there are a couple of reasons. One, too many means that they can't all exist right? No, you can't make enough business models that way. And there's also been consolidation for purchases. Like our good old friend Wunderlist is gone now. Oh, I know that Wunderlist disappeared. Did it take the app dying for me to get you to say it that way? It caused <laughs> uh, a great disruption in the life of my assistant who, oh, who ran everything on, on Wunderlist. And, and she was like, she was going down on a sinking ship and there was a lot of like, help, help, what do I turn to? <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very aware they're gone. The original founder is starting a new app called Superlist. <laughs> this is serious like they are i don't know when it's coming but like that's the thing that's happening All right but you you need a silly way to say that one you need to be able to call it like mooper list or something well, like right? uh like, supper <laughs> supper list yeah so these days i think really todoist i think todoist is king because it's everywhere mm -hmm. so like it's the easy recommendation but then, depending on the platform you use, there are, there are other options. Uh, obviously, we are both way more familiar with the iOS side. Yeah. And so, like, OmniFocus things, they're, like, the big... These, these three, they're, like, the big heavyweights in this from the sense of they are popular, but also they have a lot of potential complexity to them. You know, you can add your due dates and times, but you can also start adding projects and tags, contacts, and all these wild things which yeah really you should only start looking into if you feel that your needs are not being met yeah obviously i'm I'm not very familiar with todoist because i find myself physically repulsed by it every time i try it's getting better all the time i'm, I'm sure it is but i like i just found like oh the the physics of the way this button slides i hate right mm -hmm. like everything everything about it just rubbed me the wrong way but to be fair i haven't used it in a while you know but this is also the thing where selecting a to-do app for yourself it can be really picky. Yes, it's a difficult task to undertake. Yeah, and I, I think it's why, even if there has been consolidation in the market, there's still like infinite room for new players to come in and try because everybody's always picky in their own little ways. And, yes. and like, this is one of the things where it's kind of funny that like paper kind of has a psychological advantage because you never find yourself thinking, 
oh, I wish this paper did this, mm. right? Like your brain just accepts it as a physical object in the world. Whereas with to-do apps, you're always going to be a little bit like, oh, I wish it did it this way. My flow of recommendation would be, you know, if you're if you're picking an app for the first time, I usually recommend things to people. I think it's it's a nice combination of looks good, it's easy to use, and it has some but not too much level of complexity in it. Uh, so like things is my starting recommendation. I find things a difficult starting recommendation. Okay, why? Because it's it, it's in the sense of applications expensive and unlike. Todoist and OmniFocus has no get in the door for free. Mm. Yeah, that is true. That is true. I think Things is a good second step after Reminders. I, f- I find myself always forgetting Reminders these days from these lists. Like Reminders has a lot of the basics in it now, w- which it didn't before. Um, so Reminders yeah. is, is a, another option for a first step. But I do agree with you. Like Things is a... It's designed so well, it makes it nice to use. I find that it has some fundamental problems which stop me from using it. Mm-hmm. Like this is something that I've noticed along with like some friends for years. Like this is pretty esoteric, but it's important for me. Like if you have a repeating task, mm-hmm. you cannot complete it before the day it's due. Okay, right. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So if I have a repeating task every Wednesday, but on Monday I completed that task, it won't let me check it off until Wednesday. And that's just Mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? Right? Like, it's such a weird quirk. So there are things like that where it's like, that would frustrate me too much. Mm -hmm. And and this is the thing you've got to understand about all these types of applications. Like, none of them will work the way that you want them to completely. And it's about what level of this is okay enough. Because all of these applications are built by people with their opinions. And this is a very particular part i would say probably the most particular of all of these like even more so than email the to-do system people want it to work the exact way that they want it to work and nobody wants to work the same as anybody else yes yeah that, that's that's what i mean by there's always infinite room mm-hmm. for new entrants into the market because I, I i do think it is literally the most picky software category that can possibly exist Mm -hmm. that also a large number of people use and are like i just wish it was a little different this way i guess i i sort of bounce off reminders but you might be right that i I should update that of like reminders is the place to start if you're willing to pay for a thing that looks beautiful things is a is a place to start because i do think things maximizes on the beauty scale yes but it is both of those apps i think once you get the hang of putting your life in lists and you you start to think about the concepts of the repeating tasks and all this other stuff, you will know very quickly if you're the sort of person who is going to outgrow those apps. And then that's where, for me, OmniFocus sits at the, at the top of the list as an extremely heavyweight option. Mm-hmm. But like you'll know if you feel like this isn't working for me. And Todoist also seems like it has much more flexibility. It's not OmniFocus level, though. I didn't say that it was. Nothing is. You'll know if you outgrow reminders and you're looking for something else. I thought it might be useful for us to talk about kind of like at a basic level what our systems look like. And Mm -hmm. so for me, every task that I enter gets two things and and that's the really the core of my system so every task gets a due date and time assigned to it even if i don't really have a set time or date that something needs to be completed i will just assign one to it and then i can choose later on if i want to move it but i think Mm -hmm. to myself either a when does this need to be done by or b when would i like this to be done by That's every time I start a task, I put that in there because then it always shows up in my list of upcoming tasks in Todoist because otherwise they kind of like sit off on the side and I may forget about them. And I very frequently review what I've got over the next few days and move them around. The second thing that every task gets is a project. And I break these projects down into different areas of responsibility in my work or personal life. So I have projects that are focused around preparing for shows, editing shows, 
I have them for general admin stuff. I also have personal and long-term personal projects, that kind of stuff, right? So I have these Mm -hmm. little buckets that I will put my tasks into. And this just helps me kind of visually see what areas I need to be thinking about. But also if I think to myself, oh, I want to just sit down and do some editing today. What editing projects do I have upcoming? I can click in and see those. Now, my system is purposefully kept quite basic in this way. I think Mm -hmm. this is like the most basic an advanced system can be is to have these things, is to have a sense of setting due times on everything and setting projects for everything. Because then you can start going to other levels and Gray will have these, I'm sure, where you're like setting start dates and defer dates and tags and locations and all that kind of stuff. And I have dabbled in it. But for me personally, I have felt that none of those things helped me be more productive. And if anything, increase the amount of time it would take for me from having a thought to getting it into Todoist. Mm. So now I have basically boiled my system down to the, the basics of like a task has a name and it has a date and time set to it and it will have a project set to it. In some instances, mm. I may add some notes to the task or I may add some dependent tasks to that one task, right? So like, yes, I also need to do these three other things to call this one thing complete. But that stuff is is rare for me. It really mm-hmm. is kind of just the project and the due time. This is another one of these things about learning how you work. Yes. Because everyone who uses a to-do system, I think it tends to coalesce around something in that to-do system which is primary for them. Mm-hmm. And the, and the system that you're using, I think, is the most common, where people put a due date on every item. That is the most important part. The projects I could take or leave, the most yeah. important part is having a due time, because otherwise, I'll tell you, it's not getting done. But, but this is what I mean is like, so your system, then you think of all of the things in terms of this, mm-hmm. of like... There is the due date, and the due date is central. And I think like that's a really common system. It doesn't work for me. I hate the due dates. And it's also why, like, oh, I find other systems frustrating. But this is where, like, you just need to learn what it is that works for you. And so one of the main reasons why I stick with OmniFocus is I almost never use due dates. Like, I'm on the extreme opposite end of Mike. In my whole system, very, very few things have a due date attached to them because conceptually for me if it if there is a due date that's attached it has to mean like there's a real hard external problem that occurs if this due date is missed Mm -hmm. what i end up doing is i have a system that is primarily based around availability like which tasks are available to me to do right now and and this is where OmniFocus and our old friend, Remember the Milk, are the only two task managers I've ever come across that handle this kind of availability centricness as well as they do. So like you, my basic structure is in OmniFocus, I have a bunch of folders for general areas of my life. Like, oh, this is work. Here's a folder for my personal life. Here's a folder for miscellaneous things. And then within that, I break it down by the categories of like, okay, here's all the videos that I'm working on. Here are all the podcasts that are in motion. Here's miscellaneous other things that need to get done. So everything is like structured in this kind of hierarchy where I can build out all the different parts of like, what are all the steps that need to happen in order for an episode of Cortex to go from, you know, nothing to published on my end it's like okay boom 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 here's a whole long list of those things you know here's all the steps that are necessary to get a video from conceptual phase to published so i have that structure but then the thing that omnifocus allows me to do by having stuff categorized with their advanced features like tags is to be able to say in the morning when i wake up and i get into the office what is it that i want to do I primarily want to focus on writing tasks or research tasks. And so OmniFocus then lets me just quickly see, here are the 
writing projects that past organized you has considered to be the top three that you should be working on. And so I don't have to look at the whole structure of the project. I can just pull out the couple parts that are relevant to me in that moment. So that's what I mean by like an availability centric process or, you know, sometimes I'll feel like I can just tell I'm not quite in the right mood to write something, but I have recorded a bunch of research questions that I want to try to get answers to. So let me try to like knock off a few of those and like, here we go in OmniFocus. Let me pull up like, here's 10 questions. I just made a quick note of while I was working on a project of like, you know, how many of X is Y or like, when did this thing originally start? And now like use this time to go try to track down a bunch of these. And that's the sort of system that works really well for me. But it, it does have a much more upfront cost in knowing how to categorize things and using advanced features like defer dates that will hide things for you. But the, the reason that is important to me is because I know from experience, I cannot stand it when a to-do list manager has any way where you can see items that you cannot check off right now and like i just cannot stand that and so I'll, I'll put in a lot of effort to make sure that the system is only showing me the things that i can do at any particular moment so that's like the availability system that's what works for me so like your most important buckets are fixed to either times or locations right yeah the, the way i'm slicing the tasks is i would say times locations and energy level kind of stuff. So I have a few ways where I can look at what are a bunch of work tasks that are easy for me just to knock off right now. Communications clearing is one of these things where sometimes it's like, oh, I have to interact with the outside world. Let me pull up this list of like everything I've made a note on that requires communications. And let me just try to clear a bunch of these. And it's like, oh, write an email to this expert about this thing, you know, or, or get back to this person about this thing. And so like, let me just knock off a bunch of those in a row. So that's the way I always want to look at that kind of stuff. If this sounds complicated, it's because it is complicated. And this yeah, is why OmniFocus is good. Because yeah. OmniFocus will allow you to create effectively rules or filters which say like if this is set to this and this is set to this and it's these times of the day show me this yeah and so it, it it's a very complicated system but what makes omnifocus the best at what it does is if you are the type of person that wants to attach a bunch of metadata to a task you can do some incredibly powerful things but it's also why it's not a good starter program like it's it's going to have way too much it's going to really overwhelm you it's expert level it really yeah. is expert level and it's it's also a lot of the stuff that I'm able to do I'm doing because I have shortcuts in iOS that are assisting me so like I'm not interacting with the application directly. Like I have little templates for this is what a video project looks like. This is what every episode of Cortex looks like. So I'm able to put in a huge number of items that have been pre-categorized by me in the past because otherwise it would just be too overwhelming to do it each time. Or like when I say, oh, this is like a research question that's related to a project. I have a very quick way with shortcuts where I can write as little as possible and shortcuts will handle just put this in the correct place and file it because that's the way I solve the problem of what you were saying before of you don't want it to be a heavyweight issue to input something into the system. Putting something into the system should be really easy, but if you want to put something into a complicated system in a really easy way that does require a lot of upfront work in order to do. Or you could run these applications the way that they were kind of created and intended, which is you just enter everything very basically and then review the tasks and add that data later. So you would sit yeah. down once a day or once every couple of days look at everything that you've entered into the app's inbox and then assign it the information that it, that it needs. Yeah, right? yeah, OmniFocus does have a review feature where they specifically allow you to see all of the stuff that they think you should be um, looking over and categorizing. And and like that is totally fine, but I just I just find like if you're using OmniFocus, you're probably using it because you have a lot of items, right? Like the people I speak to who are using OmniFocus 
none of them have a small number of projects, right? Mm-hmm. They're all doing this same thing where like they've got a lot of projects with a lot of items in it. And so I think the review can become a, a little overwhelming when you start having a huge number of things. And so the the assistance in in, in inputting is really important. But I really love it. Like it's it's totally for me. But it is a real investment to learn how to use it properly. But once you have it, it's fantastic. Just as a little a little thing here, um, not connected to OmniFocus in particular, but for someone putting together their own to do system, just in general. A, a little tip that I really like, and I cannot remember where I originally came across this, but for almost any of these apps, you're going to have this concept of there's a project, and then the project has little actions that you're going to complete to get that project done. Right. Most systems will have this at least the this two tier concept, project and actions. And I think it's really helpful to always try to write the project in the past tense, as in like, what is the state of the world when this project is complete? So it's like teacher certification acquired, right? Cortex episode published research thesis submitted, right? that kind of stuff. Like, I think it's really helpful to write that in the past tense. And then you write the actions that they have to have a verb in there. There's an action that you're clearly taking, right? Go to library. There's a direction there. And I've just always found that really helpful when you're looking over your projects. There's, there's mm. something about that past tense writing of the project that I find really provokes my brain into uh, coming up with what are the verbs we need in order to make this happen? That's just my little like recommendation there for how to do this is, is like, I find that extremely helpful no matter which system you're using. And I I try very hard to stick to that with all of my projects and all of my actions is like past tense and verbs. Should we talk about time tracking? Honestly, this is the one that I get the most. I know it's almost a meme at this point that on our show we talk about time tracking, but one of the main reasons we're doing this episode today is because of all of these things, the thing that I hear about the most frequently is people are asking, can you give me an overview or tell me where to go to get an overview of your time tracking system? And so now we are providing it in this episode. Hmm, okay. And I think it's because... Time tracking, I think, is one of the newer, especially from like doing it with your devices, some one of the newer uh, productivity ideas. Hmm. Um, Email, to do, calendars, they've been around for a very long time. Right. Yeah. Calendars have been around since the Mayan civilization. Well, calendars have been around for all of time, I guess, because otherwise it wasn't being recorded. Would I would just no time? Time still happens if there's not a calendar to report it. I'll, I can. <laughs> if a calendar falls in the woods, if a big bang happens in the nothingness, does it still expand? Yes, the answer is someone yes. had to write it down eventually. <laughs> Nevertheless, I feel like time tracking is one of the more new things for people to do of their own choice. Like the idea of timesheets has been around for a long time, right? But that's typically something enforced upon you by an employer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that, like, the, that the people are asking about it, because what it also just occurs to me is I, I wonder if there's a little bit of the like a horror movie effect here where people are intrigued because they're also a little scared, right? Like, sure. The, you know, what will, if I open this time tracking door, what's behind it? And, and the mm-hmm. answer is like, it's going to be scary. <laughs> uh, I would say it's clarity. Mm. That can be good or bad. Yeah, yeah. What you will learn is something about how wrong your brain is mm-hmm. in estimating something, whether it's that you work too much or not enough, right? Yeah. So that's the main reason why I started this. You know, you go back far enough, you would, you've been doing this, you had been doing this for a while, and I, through having a bunch of conversations with you on this show, realized that I wanted to get a little bit more clarity, especially as I was navigating through self-employment, mm-hmm. about how many hours I was actually working compared to how many hours it felt like I was working. Mm-hmm. And that is like completely for me, and I maybe for you too, like the reason that I time track is to to help me reframe my mental model of 
what I'm spending my time on when it comes to work. Because when I'm working, I set a timer and I put basic information as to what I'm doing over that period of time. So then on a basis that I set, you know, or really for me, whenever I want to, I can review that data to see over a period of time how much have I worked. Sometimes it can be to check something that I'm feeling or it can be to help me make some plans. So for example, sometimes I'll get to the end of the day and I'm like, I am exhausted. And I'll look at my time tracker and be like, oh, I've logged 10 hours, 12 hours of work today. That's why, mm-hmm. right? And, and that can just be a useful thing sometimes for me to check that against myself. Or I'm exhausted. Oh, wait, I've logged four hours of work today. So there's another reason. What's that reason, right? So stuff like mm-hmm. that, you can give me those answers. Or evaluating a new project. I have a new thing coming up or I have a new t- place that I want to put some time into. Let me take a look overall over the last year about how I spent my time. Is this the right thing for me to be spending time on based upon where I'm already putting my time, right? Mm. So if I feel like, oh, I have a new podcast that I want to start, but I'm not sure if I want to edit, I feel like I do too much editing. And then I take a look at the figures and realize, oh boy, I'm doing more editing than I even thought I was based on hours. Mm. Then I would make a decision about this project as to either to not do it or to get external help to help me push something forward. All right, so these are the types of things that you can learn about yourself when you're time tracking. Mm-hmm. You know, like I hear something from friends of mine where they're like, oh, I spent all this time on this project and I've put it out there and sales were okay on it. Uh, I don't know if it was the right decision to make. But from my perspective, if you don't know how long it took you to build that thing, you're never going to know the answer as to whether it was worth it or not. You know, like the amount of hours you put into it, the amount of money you see from the end of it, right? So this is especially important if you're self-employed and making things. Then you can work out an equation as to how much money your time was worth. These are important things that, in my perspective, you can't have without some kind of time tracking system because your brain is not reliable enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the reason that I time track is very different from this, but I think it's important for everyone. But especially if you've become self-employed, nobody ever wants to do it. But I really think every newly self-employed person has to have time tracking as a part of this process, because I think there there's a very common experience for people who are self-employed to dramatically overestimate the amount of time not that they're working in quotes but that they are usefully working right so this is one of the things i implore to people is if you if you're self-employed and so the money you earn is directly proportional to the useful work that you produce be really strict about tracking the time that you are actually doing the thing that produces the value and you have to separate this from the concept of in a traditional job where like you're at that job for a set period of time and like you've been working all day because you were at work and like that is just not the same if you're self-employed and i think time tracking really helps focus that quite sharply in people's minds yeah and the reason why i say it's a horror is because anyone who has done this universally are shocked at how little of the time that they think of as i'm working is the core value production time of whatever it is they're doing and so for me the example with this is it's quite clear is time tracking writing am i writing a script and i'm extremely strict with that timer of like this starts and like the timer can only run if my fingers are moving right or if i'm saying the script out loud and if i'm not doing those things like the timer cannot run Uh, you know if you're a computer programmer it should be the same thing like are you actively working on the code is the thing to be tracking, not am I sitting at the computer? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just so easy to trick yourself into this. And 
you know, especially for a newly self-employed person to feel like, oh, I'm working 16 hours a day. And it's like, guarantee you, you aren't. And you just will not be able to have a sense of this. And, and while like all of work is useful to track, I implore people to really focus on like, what is the core value production and be super strict about that one because everything else is kind of peripheral around it. And, you know, in, in most jobs, you can kind of think about like, what is the core thing that really needs to always be done that like has to be done back when I was a teacher, like what is the core thing? There's many things you need to do, but the core thing is lesson planning. Because if you don't have lessons for tomorrow, like the day is going to come and you are going to be screwed if you have nothing to do all day. It also clarifies like marking that homework. It can wait, right? Like you can start to use time tracking partly to like sort out the priorities of things in your life. So. Mm -hmm. I really implore everyone to do this, at least for a little bit. And I'm always suspicious of when people are resistant to it, where they're like, oh, I don't need to do this. I, I've got everything under control. And I'm like, nope, that is, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the sneaksy lying part of your brain that like wants to get away with stuff when you don't want to actually keep track of things. I, so I will say this, though, that like a key difference between us that I've been aware of over the years is while I time track both much more than you. So mm -hmm. I, I time track basically every hour that I'm awake, I'm running a timer with some new small exceptions we can talk about next week. But but generally, like I'm always running a timer, but I I only really look at that data on a daily basis of the program that I'm using, which is the same one you're using behind the scenes, Toggle. If you have it in a web browser, they'll provide you like a little chart of how you're spending your time for the day. But that's really all I ever use it for. And so because I've been time tracking for so long and I don't need to do as much of that like initial calibration as, as when someone starts, I'm largely using time tracking as like an intentionality assistant. And so for me, it's become much more like pressing the timer for I'm writing is part of the process of like, I'm really writing now. And like, yeah. why is this happening? Yeah. Because the timer is running. When we finish recording this episode, you're going to go off and edit it. And then you're going to give that to me. And I'm going to go do the second edit. And it's like, what am I doing right now? I'm going to start the timer that says Cortex because right now I'm working on Cortex. And the, the thing that I really like about that is it makes it much clearer to me what am I intentionally deciding to do instead of just kind of like drifting through the day. When the moment comes where it's like, oh, I've finished Cortex or I've petered out of writing energy. Now in my life, there's always this question, which is, well, what's the next timer that you're going to start? And so it like, it forces me to always reevaluate at the end of each work unit. What's the next thing that I'm going to do? So it's just interesting to me that like, that's what time tracking has evolved into is a tool of intentionality. And it's like, you know, you've reported on like how you've spent your time each year. And I just don't really have any interest in that data for myself, except in like a, the most broad of and brief kind of ways, but uh, I don't really use it as a planning tool. I, I use something else for that, which we can talk about later. But so that's the way it works for me. I do think that that is a very valid part of time tracking too, right? Of like helping you set the expectation in your mind for what you're doing at any certain time. Mm -hmm. I am sitting down to work now. Mm -hmm. right? I think that that is a very important part of it. Or, or even like for the why do I run timers for the, the rest of things is even just like deciding to relax. I was like, oh, the day's over. What am I doing? Okay. I'm, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching a movie with my wife. Like, click, the timer starts. It's like, this is what I'm deciding to do. Great, the day's over. And I like that as make a conscious decision. Don't just drift from task to task. So that's what I like. But I just realized, I assume that you're still using Toggle, but I haven't asked you in a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I Use Toggle was merely a back end service for mm -hmm. Timery, the third party app that I love yeah. that uses Toggle's data 
and mm. timers, but it's a it's an iOS app that is just fantastic. Um, and then on the Mac, I use the Toggle app, which is terrible, but, <laughs> but gets the job done. But that that's what I use, right? And mm. then, of course, we both have some shortcuts that we've created that allow just being able to set things easily. And I use Timery's shortcuts that they've created to add in to existing shortcuts that I make to make that stuff sing. But yeah, Toggle's service is good. It's pretty rock solid. I like that it also has the ability to create an account that can have team information in it. My sales manager, we have them track their time through Toggle, mm-hmm. which is useful for them because then they can use that to, to bill us. Mm-hmm. That is a useful part of time tracking. If you are self-employed and you bill people based on the time that you work, this is the best way to get that in, that data is to actually track the time that you're doing because you're really tracking what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. And most of these applications, including Toggle, will allow you to create a report based on that information to help you do the billing that you need to do. Yeah. Neither of us bill anyone, right? We like, don't use billing, but there is sort of one exception to looking at the data, which I use. So this is just a little, little suggestion if someone wants to use it this way. So Toggle allows you to have this additional setting, which is they want it for like billable hours. Mm-hmm. But I use the billable hours Toggle as time that i highly value so this is either the core stuff like writing and researching a script but i'll also use it for exercise time and so i am always thinking of like billable hours in their little system just are tracked completely separately and so i always feel like i wanted i do in a particular day always want to kind of hit a certain number of hours where i feel like these are all the high value activities so that's like the writing, it's the exercise, it's certain kinds of reading, those three things like, you know, these are the best ways that I can spend my working time. So they're not billable hours, but I do love that Toggle does pull those things out and I can quickly see like, I sort of don't care about the whole day, but I do care about these numbers. Like these numbers combined should always be um, like at a certain point. Hmm, Interesting. Yeah, that's that's how I use the billable hours. (laughs) I never would have thought to do that. I, I wouldn't use that but i can see it being a thing that you could use from a setup perspective for me i actually have a pretty similar arrangement to how my to-do system is by design so when when you set a time tracker you can give it a description so you can type in freeform what you're doing and then you can add projects and tags now I only use projects and tags. I never feel like I need to to write a description of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I basically set it up that my projects are the things in my life that I work on. And by and large, they are named the same as the projects in my to-do list. Mm -hmm. Right? So in Todoist. I'm not like laying this data over one or the other, but it just helps me just mentally keep track of what's being worked on because I don't have to think about like, what do I call it in Todoist versus what do I call it in Toggle? Mm -hmm. right so like you know i'll have like sponsors i'll have show prep and all that kind of stuff it's probably time for me to review these i would like to actually pare them down a little bit more and then i also use tags and the tags are the names of the shows that i'm on Mm. because if i am using the podcast recording or podcast editing project that is almost useless for me unless i'm saying what show it is that i'm doing right because you want to be able to pull out the data per show Yeah, because that can differ wildly because like I don't edit every show that I'm on. Mm -hmm. So if I just had podcast editing and podcast recording, those numbers would be completely wrong, Mm -hmm. right? Because I would be making like, oh, for every minute I record, I am editing for this many minutes where like that's not technically accurate, Yeah, right? So I I like to, to, to assign the shows to it because then I can also drill that down later on as well to be like, okay, so... How many hours have I worked on Cortex versus Upgrade this year? And again, that can work out at the end of the year, right? Like how much money did I make from each of those shows? And then if I want to make decisions on those shows, then I can, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, that's why I like this data Mm is because it helps me make decisions. I don't do that often, but I've done it on a few occasions and it has helped me come to an answer that I otherwise couldn't do. So yeah. like I do find having this data is useful, but the main reason I do it is just so I can, I really deal with this this information in the macro 
Uh, wait, which one is which? Micro is small, macro is large. Then I deal with these things in the micro. Okay. Because I always think of macro lens. Macro lens lets you take pictures of things that are close up. That's where I get confused. Yeah, because the, yeah, the lens is big. It lets you see things that All right, are small. But like, the result is something that's... <laughs> Sm- anyway <laughs> right but do you understand i know i know i'm wrong here right obviously but do you understand wh- wh- how i get that wrong it's totally confusing you're not okay. you're not wrong to be confused at all yeah a macro lens is a terrible name for it i am typically using the this data to make decisions about like how did i feel today like you really like it's more like today but i then have this pool of data that exists that i can draw conclusions from mm-hmm. if i want to um, how do you set up your projects and tag system with your time tracking? See, now this is where I'm just the total opposite because my time tracking system is, I only use the top level, like tags and stuff. I've never touched it. Descriptions, I've never written a description. Yeah, see, I've never written a description either. So you're just using like projects then. Here's, here's the thing. I'm using projects. And the reason I use projects is because you can have them show up as different colors in the little pie chart that oh, Toggle I love that. makes. The yeah. colors is so important. Yeah. And so for the videos, trying to hour track the particular videos is not really useful. I know I tried it briefly for a while, but I was like, this is dumb. This is not really helpful. I don't actually, because of the way my video production process is, like, I just don't really care about how many hours were spent on one project versus the other like there there just isn't actionable information for me in in the same way because those projects are largely defined by how interesting i think they potentially are and it's like if something's interesting and it's going to take a million hours like well that's the way i make the videos and there's nothing actionable going forward with that so that's why i only track in extremely broad ways of like i'm writing but i don't have sub tags for which project is this or i'm doing video editing right now and i don't do sub tracking for that for me the main thing with the time tracking is the colors are really vital so it's mm-hmm. like i use dark blue for the high value work time and I use light blue for things like administrative tasks or, you know, like email or any of that kind of stuff. I use my least favorite color, purple. What you got against purple? It's just, it's not a nice color. Hmm. But I use purple specifically for what I think of as like transition periods that need to happen, but are also kind of danger zones. So it's just like, when you wake up in the morning, how long is it before you actually start working? right? So like I have a little timer and it's called boot up. It's like when I wake up in the morning, like I hit the boot up timer and that starts adding like this ugly purple to the timer of my day. And so it provides like a little incentive always of like, you want the least amount of purple. So those kinds of like have to get done, but are not intrinsically valuable in and of themselves transition tasks. I'll use that way or colors that are like for free time stuff is a lot of yellow or green. And so This is where like, I really like being able to see the colors because I can just have a very quick sense of how the day is going. And I find it quite motivating to be like, keep the colors that you like or that represent good things in your life large and keep the colors for things that are not good as small as possible. The most dreaded color on my calendar is black, which is for unintentional time. And that's where if I've started a timer, but for whatever reason, I don't actually do the thing that the timer said, like, oh, I need to I need to research some facts about this project. But I got distracted by Reddit. It's like, oh, no, once I realize I've been distracted by Reddit and it's it's two hours later and I've been looking at like power washing videos, I've got to go to that timer and you can just quickly change the project. And so I'll change that project name to like unintentionality which means like you didn't do the thing you intended to do and this is like the worst way to spend your time so that's how i use those colors on a like on a daily basis but i'm not very specific with the details of like which project is related to what like i just don't find that useful or actionable for me and whilst i get it because i've heard you mention it a few times it, it does always make me chuckle about the idea of tracking unintentionally used time because it's like how do I know I'm doing it? And I know you do it after the fact, right? Like, yeah. But it's still, it's, it's still like a funny, it's just like a funny thought, right? Like if someone just coming cold to that, be like, how did you track time where you weren't paying attention? How did you do it? <laughs> I get why it's funny, but I, I really think it's actually one of the most 
vital parts for me. This is why like always run a timer makes some things really easy. And for catching yeah. yourself when you've gone off track, this is super easy because you can look at the timer that says writing and realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm still like puttering around because I actually realized I needed to fill up the coffee and I didn't get started. And then like, so now I can just say like, oh, this was unintentional time. Like this was, this was epic fail. And I know exactly how long I spent not doing the thing that I intended to do. And I have to say, like, by doing that over the years, I've definitely gotten much, much better about the intentionality of like, what am I doing right now? Like, I have to use that less and less. And I think it's because it, it provides that feedback of like, I don't want to have to put black on this calendar. Mm. So what am I doing? And if I'm realizing like, I'm not in the mood to get this high quality task done, I'm going to make a decision. Okay, you know what? I'm going to read a book for a while or I'm going to watch some YouTube videos and I track that time differently of like I've intentionally decided to do this other thing and that's way better than unintentionally just doing it because I feel like that decision is really important um but again like that this is this is the way that I'm using the time tracking is like this decision aiding tool I will say if someone does want to run a lot of timers my suggestion here if you're using iOS is I have the same stack that Mike does, you know, Toggle. I'm using Timery as the interface for Toggle. But the primary reason I'm using Timery is because it has amazing integration with shortcuts. But here's, here's, here's like the great pro tip on time tracking. I make shortcuts for all of the various timers that I want to run. And what you can do in shortcuts is turn every shortcut into a like a little app, a little pseudo app on the phone. So you can say like, make the shortcut exist on my home screen. And I just put all of those little pseudo apps in a folder on my phone so they just disappear. But when I go to time track, I always do it on the phone and I swipe down on the phone to pull up that little search bar. And you know how iOS has the suggested apps that you should use at any particular time? Because the, you now have all of your little timers are pseudo apps, I've found that iOS actually gets pretty good at guessing <laughs> which timer do you want to run when. That is clever. Yeah. So I, I would say like probably at this point, 90% of the time, if I pull down on, on the phone to like pretend like I'm going to search, one of the top three pseudo apps is the timer that I want to run at that moment. And so it's great. There's only a couple of other like timers that I use super frequently that I put in the little widget uh, you know, to slide over with timery. But that's what I do for running like a bunch of timers if you also want to be the sort of person who's always running timers. So that, that works really well for me. And something that I like about timery and its shortcut support is you then have the ability to add that into the flow of another shortcut. So mm -hmm. for example, I have a shortcut that's called show prep. And when I tap it, it asks me, what show are you preparing for? So I would tap, say, Cortex, and it will open the Cortex Google Doc for me and also set a time tracker for preparing for Cortex. Mm. Or I have another one, which I run to just like get my phone ready for when I'm recording, so like set it on do not disturb and stuff like that, make sure that the volume's down, all those things. Mm. But it will also look at my calendar and set a recording timer with the tag, the name of the next upcoming event on my calendar, and I have the events named just right. <laughs> so it will say for example upgrade it's just the name of the calendar event i don't need it to be anything more than that so then it just adds the tag of the word upgrade which is the same as the tag in my time tracker so it can just pull that data in throw it into the tag field and then it's all set mm -hmm. it's little stuff like that you play around with it but i like that so i like building my time trackers Ian is just automatic parts of a shortcut, which will enable me to do the work that I'm trying to do at the moment. Mm. So I like that. Communication. So we spoke about email, but, you know, there's more communication than email. There's been a lot of communication apps that have been created to try and get rid of email. Right. I mean, Slack is the main thing here, I think, for work communication. <sighs> then you've got messaging apps, right? Yeah. So iMessage, that kind of thing is like another part. 
But the only reason I really wanted to talk about the communication apps today is to highlight something that you imparted upon me, which has been very useful in many of my creative projects with people that are also my friends, which is uh, conversation silos. Mm -hmm. So I really just wanted to mention this again today as like an important thing to think about as a like productivity philosophy thing, especially if you work with somebody that you also have a friendship with, which I think is something that lots of people are doing more and more these days. And that is the idea of having multiple places where you talk to the same person, but you talk about work in one place and everything else in another. So for me and Gray, we have now three places where we talk. So we have iMessage, Mm -hmm. where by and large, iMessage is we just talk like friends, unless, and we're both pretty good at this, like if something is urgent, we know we can reach each other always by iMessage. Right. Right. So like, for example, if when we record today, I need if I needed to start editing immediately and it's two hours later and I don't have your audio, the place that I'm going to message you is iMessage because it's urgent communication and it's most like, I would expect you're most likely to be looking at iMessage than Slack, right? Mm-hmm. But by and large, for all work stuff related to the show, we will talk in the Relay FM Slack. And then we also have a Slack for Cortex brand, which right. is everything else. <laughs> related to our business together yes yes and the value in having these silos is it means that work and personal do not get intermixed of each other and to maintain a friendship when you work with someone i find this incredibly important to make sure that you're keeping those things separated so that you can have those spaces that are safe I think the, one of the importance of siloing is you don't want to get an iMessage from your friend, but before you're able to see the text preview or whatever of the message, to start to get a Pavlovian response of, oh, is there some problem with the work, right? Or is, is there something that I, like, I need to handle right now? And so by, for the most part, keeping the conversations separate, you avoid that constant intermingling. And I also think it's good because it allows you to be able to have a business conversation in the business environment that leaves your friendship at the door. And you can just say like, okay, we got to make some decisions about this thing. And I think it's really good to be able to separate those, those different aspects of like, what is the relationship between these two people? Because it can get quite muddled up. So yeah, I'm, I'm always in favor of siloing conversations if possible. With communication systems, you know, there are a lot of tools. I think this always ends up being very specific to the person and what their communication is is like. So I don't have a, a lot to say on here, except, yeah, just be intentional about which tool are you going to use for which kind of communication. This is not as deep as the other things in the show, but like that piece of information I really find to be quite important to people working today. Mm -hmm. Because this can be like with your colleagues, it's very normal to become friends with people that you work with. Yeah, Just keep that work conversation outside of your usual messaging app, Mm -hmm. right? Like talk about the other stuff that you have in common rather than did you finish the report? Yeah. Keep that, keep that in email, keep that in Slack or whatever. I mean, Slack continues to be the only other real business communication tool that I have. Mm -hmm. Slack continues to grow into this beast of a thing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. But it's great. Like, you know, it's Slack is like it suffers from it not necessarily being bad in any way, but people just start to associate what's in it with the application. Yeah. You know, everyone loves Slack when it first came around because it was different and then they were creating like communities within it. So it's like, oh, I love it because it's got this community aspect to it. But then your employer picked it up and then it became the place where work happens and then yeah. you're just less excited about it. <laughs> Well, yeah, I also think Slack has one feature that I think is particularly guilty of removing siloing and kind of muddying the waters of the Slack. And that's their general channel. And I think for even in many like business focused Slacks, the general place can become a a real hotbed of nonsense that is also like where friends are chatting but this is also the place where we work i can't imagine what a general room in a corporate slack must look like yeah it must look like madness 
the way I have actually set up the Slack that I use for all of the, the video and all of my related work, I've disabled the general channel. Like there is, there is no general conversation mm -hmm. because I, I really do want to try to keep it very strict of like, okay, guys, we've got channels for projects. And like this channel is where we discuss like what needs to be done for this project. And if there's something that's not directly related to a project, like that's what direct messages are for. I'm the like this grumpy person who's like, I don't want reaction gifts. Like, I don't want all these other things. Like, let's be very clear. Like, this is where we're trying to get this project brought close to completion. And I just I often think like that general channel. I don't know. Like, I think that's why people were like, oh, Slack is so fun because there's this built in room where we can just like hang out with our friends. It's like, mm -hmm. but yeah, you probably shouldn't be hanging out with your friends in Slack. You should probably find some other method for that because then now you're mixing like work and friendship in a weird way sometimes. I think this was just as it changed, mm -hmm. right? So like for a lot of people, when Slack first came around, it was like there is a community of people here, right? Like there is a group of people around a certain type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, when it first was coming onto the scene, I think it was more like we're a large group of friends. This gives us somewhere to hang out together. But it has become a tool which has been adopted by Workplace because that's what actually what it's for. Mm -hmm. So Discord has come in mm -hmm. and I think has picked up a lot of the community stuff. And Discord is, is similarly structured. It has its general rooms or whatever. But I think people, and I know I feel differently about Discord because it is more just like community than work. Yeah. And let's talk about calendars. I have a very simple calendar philosophy events go on the calendar like things that are going to happen and end at a certain time they go on the calendar i have a bunch of calendars like work calendars personal calendars shared calendars i don't have a very complicated calendar structure uh, every event has a like a notification five minutes before just because i like that i feel like my calendaring is very typical you may have a simple calendar system but i feel like you have a lot of events on that calendar yeah 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 i've i i have lots and lots of events yes but i don't feel like it's different to like the calendar i kept when i had a regular job like hmm. the calendar when i because it's full of meetings mm -hmm. right so similar for me like just recordings and calls and meetings replaced the meetings like it mm -hmm. was all just blocks of time but i don't really do anything particularly different i feel to the average person who uses a calendar but i know that you you have some different uses for your calendars like you have specific calendars that you only look at at specific times stuff like that so i think that's where i'm different like all of my calendars are enabled yeah yeah i, I am very much not a not a you know talking about the spectrum at the beginning like i don't use the calendar in, in the way that many people do in some ways the calendar for me has two totally separate and unrelated functions. The one function is for my one calendar that I call changes, which basically means any interruptions in what would otherwise be my totally internal life, right? Of like, oh, here is a meeting that you need to go to, or there's going to be a conference this week, or you have to do a call with this person at this time. And so like, I have this one calendar that just shows all of the time-based items that are different from just what would be my normal ideal week just on my own, minding my own business. And so in that way, my calendar is ridiculously simple because I also try extremely hard to limit how many items are ever going to be on that calendar mm. it's mostly a tool for things like you know if i need to do a call about something i try to look at the calendar and then put the calls all on the same day because i'll feel like oh as soon as a day has something like a dentist appointment that whole day is ruined so i might as well like stack a bunch of calls or other stuff on that day and like, that's the way I use it. <laughs> yeah, so, like, this is, like, that funny thing for me where it's like, oh, I have an empty day. Fill it up of calls, right? Like, that's, you know, it's just this sad thing that I end up doing to myself where I'm, like, so excited <laughs> about there being an empty day next week. And then someone says, oh, hey, can we have a call? And I'm like, oh, I have an empty day. I'll just put one call in here. And then, they, like, three calls get stacked on that because 
once I add one call, it's no longer the empty day anymore. Right. Then for it's a full up with calls day. Yeah. So for me, my ideal calendar, like if I look at a week, I want to have zero items on that changes calendar. Like I, d- I don't want to see like, oh, there's a dinner that you have to go to with this thing. It's like, nope, I want none of that. Like that's always what I'm trying to arrange. Right. Because any added event to the changes calendar is going to start the cascade. I feel like it changes the whole feeling of a day. Like I just hate, I hate knowing like, oh, I've got to be at that place tonight. Right. And it's like, I, as soon as I wake up in the morning, I know it's coming. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I try I try very hard to limit what's on that what's on that calendar. So in, in some ways the way a normal person uses a calendar, I have one calendar and it's and just events go on that and I try very hard to to keep it nice and simple. But the other way that I do use the calendar which I don't know, I probably do like two or three times a year and I actually just did it last week is as a theoretical planning tool. So I will sometimes sit down and say, okay, you know, I've, I've been doing this long enough and I do know from my daily numbers, like I have a sense of how many hours can you spend writing on a good day or like how much exercise do you want to do, you know, on average over the course of this week? And then like, How many times do you have a podcast to record? How long does that podcast take to edit? And I start to put all of those items on a calendar because a week isn't quite right. I do this over a 14 day time period and I'll I'll build up what I think of as the theoretically perfect time period. And it's much more that which I use to try to make decisions about what do I want to do? Or what do I not want to do? Or if I'm going to take on a new project, where does that project fit in here? Like, what am I going to take time from? And how much downtime do I want to have? Or, you know, like reading is an important thing for me, but I always kind of put it off. Where should reading go in my life on on like, what I would imagine to be like, oh, the, this would be two weeks. And if I followed this calendar perfectly, I would feel like I could not have done better in, in life. And I think people will hear this and what, what they'll hear is that I've scheduled my time, but that's not really correct because I'm not a calendar person. I'm not using this as here is the regime that I must follow. It's much more of just an evaluation of You only have so many quality hours in the day. There's only so many things that can be done. And just seeing how does this fit together over a longer period of time. And this I find just a really useful process. And like the broad outlines of it doesn't really change all that much because, you know, I know the rhythm of my own life that I'm most productive in the very early morning and in the evening time and like afternoons are sort of a more difficult downtime. And like, I I know these rhythms, but it's really useful when just thinking about what am I focusing my time on to do this theoretically perfect week. And I always find that an incredibly valuable thing to do. And especially like with recently, how there are many things that will have impacted my theoretical schedule to sit down and be like, okay, let me think through Mm -hmm. going forward. What do I want the weeks to look like? And so I don't do that often, but that is where I use the calendar as a kind of time planning tool. And I don't stick to it. It's not a regime. I've never found the whole like set a schedule for yourself advice to be useful. My brain just does not work that way, which is why I use more task focused system. But I I do like using the calendar for that. And then just on a more minor scale, a thing that you and I were doing before we started the call today is there is a more actionable version of this where I have a calendar where I'm keeping track of when are things going to be posted and what's going on in the world. So having a rough sense of like, you know, when do I think the next video is going to go up? And, you know, when is a Cortex episode going to go up? Or what else is going on in my life around those times? Or like, what holiday is it? Or all these kinds of things. So I do have a sort of 
broad posting planning kind of schedule, but obviously because of uh, the way I work, none of those things are certain, but it's still useful to be able to try to keep things from overlapping too much or just being aware of, oh, there's a big event that's planned for this week. That's probably not a time where you can even conceive that you're going to post something. So Mm -hmm. that's the other way that I use a calendar. From a calendar tool perspective, I'm all about Fantastical. Yeah. Is there any other tool that's useful if you have an even moderately complicated calendaring system? No. Fantastical is like the one Drew calendar app, and that's the one I use mm-hmm. too, for sure. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of it. They have all of the features that I'm looking for. I've, I've really been happy with their newest version, like with the new iPad app and stuff. Like, oh, it's great. It's, it's so really, good. Really very good. And it works wonderfully with the trackpad support. Like, I think it's wonderful. I'm I'm very very happy. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing else to even discuss. Like, fantastic or GTFO. Don't you use Apple Calendar for some stuff though, or have you changed that? I know that you were using it. The, the only reason I used to use Apple Calendar is because Fantastical didn't support the groups on iOS, right? Like the calendar groups where you can switch back and forth. And so uh-huh. I used Apple Calendar. I set it a particular way to be an alternate group that I could quickly look at, but. Now that Fantastical has the calendar groups that you can toggle on and off on iOS, like I have no need for Apple Calendar. Like, goodbye. I'll never see you again. <laughs> oh, so that was, I guess, Productivity 101, right? Like, we're done now. That's all of it. Everyone can go ahead. Just go be productive now. We've given you everything we know. It feels like we did a lot of it. <laughs> I, th- I think so. Like, I feel, I feel like we have given the complete overview that I wanted to. On our next episode... We're going to move some of this stuff forward a little bit and also relate it to a video that you just produced called Spaceship U, which is really excellent. Um, If you haven't seen this video yet, you should before the next episode. But I want to kind of talk a little bit more about that idea in general. And it's also kind of like relating to just working from home again as like coming back to that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some really interesting themes in there that I want to explore and also check in on how we're both doing. Mm -hmm. So go and watch that video. Link will be in the show notes and uh, we'll talk about it next time.